Welcome to Sid Cordell CPA and uh, the Week in Focus. And um, we go and say the same boring things every week, Sid, Sid, but the world is turning faster and faster. Um, Christmas is approaching. Uh, time of cheer. Um, well, I don't know. Uh, don't say that to Rishi, who, as we speak, is facing another indictment for his large yes during the pandemic. He's given too much money away. And he was called uh, Dr. Death at one point. Um, so he's got that to face. He's got to face his own back benches, front benches, middle benches. Sid, let's be honest, it's a complete and utter shambles, the Tory party. Um, you can't go wrong if you labour, or can you? Well, I think, you see, the thing is, is that there's... The, the, the Conservative Party is undoubtedly divided. I mean, there's half the Conservative Party that voted for same-sex marriage and half of them that voted against. And I think we're seeing battles that are continuing along the same lines. I mean, the current battle now is probably over trying to ban conversion therapy. You know, there's half of the Conservative Party that say, oh, yeah, we've got to ban it. And the other half are saying it's just ridiculous. It's crazy to even think about banning something that, you know, when people got unwanted same-sex attraction and want some help or want some prayer, and you say, we're going to ban it, and it's just ridiculous. And now Kemi Badenoch is coming forward with her with her plans. But, I mean, we might talk about that later. But at, at, at the end of the day, they are hopelessly divided. And what is thrown into the mix is the media, the left-wing media. Because, of course, the left-wing media are very much opposed to the half of the Conservative Party that basically supports Christian values. And they're going to give them a rough time. And the way Boris Johnson was behaving, it looked as though he was very much favouring that, that faction, but at least trying to sit in the middle. They destroyed him. Um, but, of course, everything that they destroyed him for, Rishi Shunak was also involved in. I mean, all these parties that were supposed to be taking place, which Boris Johnson, inc incidentally, when he was giving evidence to the COVID inquiry, said, oh, it was totally exaggerated he said what actually took place was nothing that like what the media were actually saying i mean and you know the whole thing was just ridiculous that's what he said to the covid inquiry but rishi shunak was part of those parties all the decisions that boris johnson took in terms of lockdowns and so on and so forth rishi shunak was part of those decisions and involved in making those decisions you know at that time as chancellor of the exchequer so if if Boris Johnson deserved to be removed as Prime Minister because of what he did, then Rishi Shunak is involved in exactly the same things. I mean, which is which is crazy. Um, it it amuses it, me, Sid, that um, the clip showing Sir Keir at a party drinking be uh, beer, as, as one does as a socialist, of course, as opposed to the, uh, the champagne down in Downing Street. Uh, but it got airtime, of course it did, but nothing like the stuff that came out about Boris. Was Boris the greatest sinner? Well, exactly, but this is the media. The media have got it in for Boris because largely, I mean, I think the main reason they've got it in for him is because he was the architect of Brexit, you know, during the referendum. I mean, it was Nigel Farage undoubtedly got us a referendum through the support for UKIP, but once the referendum was called, we if Nigel Farage had led the campaign to leave the EU, then we would have lost. But we needed somebody strong from the Conservative Party to lead that campaign, and Boris Johnson stepped forward, and he was brilliant. And he, he led the campaign brilliantly during the referendum period, and um, he also led the party brilliantly when he took uh, took over in 2019 and uh, won an incredible election at the end of 2019. And that's what the media can't forgive him for, <clears throat> for the way he just turned all that round and got Brexit done. <clears throat> so, well, according got... to everybody uh, at the moment, uh, the Tories are absolute toast. Uh, there's not a cat in uh, the proverbial place chance of them getting back. Well, you see, the thing is, even though the Conservative Party is undoubtedly very unpopular. The Labour Party also is unpopular in a lot of circles. I mean, the media are trying to make out that, oh, the next election is a total foregone conclusion. The Labour Party is going to sweep the ball 
board with a with a massive majority. Um, but it's not necessarily going to happen because, as I've said before, I mean, during the by-elections, even though the Labour Party won them, it was a case of Conservative voters staying home, not Conservative voters going out and voting Labour. Um, but it seems as though a large number of Conservative voters are now were switching towards Reclaim and they're rising strongly in the polls. Now, what effect that will have in a first-past-the-post system, I don't, I don't know, because... When it comes down to it, are there going to be specific seats that Reclaim can go for and win? And, um, you know, or are they just going to take votes across the board from the Conservative Party, which actually lets Labour in? I mean, that's the that's what's unclear at the moment. But from our perspective, we want to smash the two party system. So people don't vote either Labour or Conservative, that the left wing of the Labour Party goes out and votes Green or Lib Dem because they've all said ceasefire now and supporting Hamas. So the people resigning from the Labour Party can support the Lib Dems or the Greens. And people on the Conservative Party that are unhappy with Rishi Shunak, who's betraying them over, over immigration and betraying them over the EU, appointing, appointing David Cameron, they can go to reclaim. Now, can they get enough votes for these other smaller parties to actually win seats? Well, it remains to be seen. I really, really hope they can. Well, they're talking about half a dozen at best, uh, which is um, our electoral system. Uh, will it ever change? Can it ever change? Well, it, it can do. I mean, there's nothing wrong in principle with the idea that the person in a particular constituency who gets the most votes... Um, goes and, and represents that constituency in Parliament. There's nothing wrong in principle with that idea. It's just that in practice, it um, it works out very strongly against small parties. So, um, you know, but in principle, there's nothing wrong with campaigning hard in specific seats. I mean, the Lib Dems have shown that it is possible for them to win over 40 seats in general elections, in two general elections. It was only because they completely betrayed their voters that um, that they then went massively down after getting elected. But it is possible, you know, to target seats and and win 40 or 50 seats in an election. And the Lib Dems also show that it was then possible to be part of a coalition and be and take power. So, you know, it is possible. Sid, um, you're leader of the Christian People's Alliance. Now, Christianity is not very popular. Some people say brought it on itself, uh, the way the church are behaving in various guises. Uh, but there's certainly quite a lot of anti-Christian feeling, even in the United Kingdom. Have you noticed this on the doorstep? Is it an advantage for you to be called CPA? Um, well, <clears throat> we haven't got enormous numbers of votes so we're not overwhelmingly popular but i've certainly not found on the doorstep we're overwhelmingly unpopular either there's just very few people that have been really anti-christian and been offensive on the doorstep very few and quite honestly i mean in the past as you probably know i've campaigned extensively for the conservative party when i was a member there between 1978 and and 2004 and I campaigned during the Margaret Thatcher era in, in, in Labour areas in Sheffield. And, and the uh, offence I got on the doorstep, or the abuse, I should say, that I got on the doorstep was phenomenal. You know, they should shoot that woman and so on and so forth. I mean, was was a quite frequent comment. So I've been used to getting abuse on the doorstep. And I had far more abuse on the doorstep when campaigning for the Conservative Party than I've ever had campaigning for the CPA. So... The idea that there's vast numbers of people out there that are anti-Christian is just simply untrue. The, the actual, the reality is that there's a, a, a large minority that are anti-Christian that are reflected in the left-wing media and in in the message that the left-wing media are putting out, which is an anti-Christian message. Yes, indeed. Um, I'm going to uh, liken Rishi to uh, Ten Hag. We're going to take a bit of a rest from politics and go into soccer, although politics in soccer is just as bad as politics in politics. 
we remember the great old days of Sir Alex Ferguson and all the other managers Manchester United have had since. Now, something's odd here. Like we don't know what goes on all the time at Whitehall and number 10, we certainly don't know what goes on at Old Trafford, except uh, the Glazers. Now, they're the um, common denominator in this because they've wielded power even during Sir Alex's time. But never has a club with so much background, history, uh, gone from disaster to disaster. Makes the Tory party look quite successful. And uh, Ten Hag's on the, um, on the cusp. He's about to be thrown out up the cliff. Now... Thinking of who's behind this, 25% um, of the votes, on condition, as I understand it, of the football club, are going to come to a British businessman. And he's threatened, promised, as a long-time Manchester supporter, uh, to do something about it as long as he gets the power. Now, is it big business winning over everything else, Sid? Well, well, the, the first, the first I should say is the whole issue of the managers. Now, it's interesting. I remember the time when Sir Matt Busby, of course, was an incredibly successful manager at Manchester United, and they were winning European Cups and goodness knows what. When he left, they really struggled to replace him, and the club actually got relegated from what is now the Premiership to. Um, to the championship, what was then the first division to the second division, um, after he left. I mean, it was a terrible, terribly difficult to replace him. And then, of course, along came Sir Alec Ferguson. But when he first became manager of Manchester United, he wasn't successful. I mean, he was very successful at Aberdeen and came to Manchester United and really struggled. But it was only after a year or two, fortunately, they stuck with him. And it was after a year or two that he got his the team that he wanted and got his feet under the table and started producing the goods and, of course, was then phenomenally successful. So it's not surprising that when he left, that they struggled to replace him. And the managers that they brought in haven't been bad managers. I mean, David Moyes, who came in, is now proving very successful at West Ham, has actually won a... European trophy for West Ham and Josie Mourinho. I mean, he's been successful all over the world. I mean, he's, he's very successful at Real Madrid. He's been successful now at Roma in Italy and uh, was very successful for Chelsea. I mean, but somehow didn't manage to produce the goods at Manchester United. And Den Haag, quite honestly, in my view, if they get rid of him, they'll be mad because he's been the most successful since Sir Alec Ferguson left. But at least they're not in a position now that they were in after Sir Matt Busby left, where they're in danger of relegation. I mean, you know, Manchester United are a great club, and they need to stick with this manager and let him produce the goods. And I'm sure if he's given time, he will produce the goods and he'll be an incredibly successful manager. Now, the other side of the coin is the power of big business. Well, I find it absolutely infuriating that Manchester United were a club completely without debt, very, very successful, having a wonderful stadium. And uh, the Glaziers come in and buy the club and basically borrow uh, the, against the value of the club in order to buy it, which I find incredible, frankly. But that's what they did. And they managed to buy it for a billion pounds. Um, but then a few years later, they're selling it for four billion. So... You know, and and new owners are coming in. New owners are very rich. This Sir Jim Ratcliffe, you know, God bless him, very rich gentleman. You know, but they shouldn't just be looking for instant success and just responding to a bad result. I mean, they've just had a very bad result, but they shouldn't just be saying, oh, we've had a bad result, sack the manager. They've got to look far, far deeper than that at the direction the club's going and the quality of the players, the quality of the players coming in and how much time they've had to settle down and 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 produce the goods. I mean, Hoyland, for instance, has only just come in. They reckon he's a brilliant striker, but he's not really had any chance to have a go. No, but lots of people have said, and uh, I, in my opinion, people have been accusing uh, Manchester United of not splashing the cash. Uh, getting second um, division 
players as opposed to first division players. Uh, if they'd have spent another 20 million on each individual they purchased, they could have got uh, the likes of the top of the world. Instead, uh, the Glazers said, no, we're not releasing that money. Uh, and you've only got to look at anything coming out of the Arab world. These are the successful clubs. Money does it again. Yes and no. I mean, see, <clears throat> I mean, Alex Ferguson was incredibly successful with a lot of brilliant young players. I mean, who we now know as Beckham and Giggs and and, and Skulls and Butt and all these people. They just, they came through the youth system at Manchester United. They weren't bought in. You know, and Manchester United have been very, very good at producing excellent youth players. And if you go look at a club like Blackburn, for instance, that splashed the cash and bought all the top players at the time, you know, Shearer and Sutton and, you know, brilliant strikers, where are they now? Because they didn't have the fundamental basics of the club working. And just spending enormous amounts of money and bringing in the top players doesn't necessarily create a successful club long term. Um, so, no, I, the manager is very important. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we've seen that at Manchester City, you know, having a very good manager, you know, that's able to motivate the club and motivate the players and bring in good players from elsewhere bit by bit, you know, is, is a very, very good process that you have to go through. Just throwing loads of money at the problem. I mean, Chelsea have thrown a lot of money at their team and look at where they are. I mean, just throwing a lot of money at the team is not the answer. Right, we've got to leave that regretfully, but I'm going to go to our favourite friends, the BBC. Now, um, late one night, um, I normally listen to the last latest headlines, uh, how sad am I, uh, for the next day's interviews, uh, but I'd had enough. So I thought, oh, let's get through to the iPlayer. Now, I had heard something about Doctor Who uh, and a bit of a scandal and, um, well, I call it a scandal. Um, I've not watched Doctor Who for centuries. And I thought, go on then. It's one o'clock in the morning. I'll get it on the iPlayer. And I watched it for a full hour. Boy, has he changed, Sid. I mean, gone are the old days where uh, the doctor leaned against a cupboard door and it sort of waved around in the air because it was cardboard. The acting was not much less wooden than the um, the scenery. Um, but my goodness me, CGI's got in there with a vengeance. It's like watching a Hollywood movie. Um, it's fabulous. But then I got mad and getting mad at, well, it was practically two o'clock in the morning, uh, because the BBC did not let itself down. Because I looked at the storyline and I I looked, first of all, at the fact that um, Doctor Who, who'd been in it before, was reincarnated. Uh, they reincarnate everybody uh, every now and again, the BBC, to fit in the, with the local uh, timely prejudice of where we should be in inclusivity. So we had um, nothing wrong with this. Uh, a black taxi driver uh, married to a very attractive white lady who was the chief uh, central actress in all this. That's fine. Doesn't represent uh, the numbers. Now, I'll leave it at that regarding that. And then along floated an animal. Beautifully animated. You can't tell it was an animal. Uh, it was very um, articulate, big eyes, and it looked like the real deal, an alien. And there was the alien talking to Doctor Who. Um, are you male and female or male or what are you? And they had a great discussion about personal pronouns. Uh, are we getting, getting the track of all this? Um, were there they, they, she, it? Uh, they agreed to uh, sort of differ and you could choose your own personal pronoun. Interesting. And then um, the lady in charge of the whole thing, because Earth was being invaded, and the maestro was a lady, 
uh, in charge of this and Doctor Who had to keep going to her and saying, uh, can I do this? Can I do that? Should I do this? Should I do that? Uh, well, that's all right. Man or woman. But tell me, Sid, why did she have to be in a wheelchair? If you look at the BBC programme, it's full of nonsense. All their programmes are. They've all got an agenda, whether it be farming today, uh, whether it be the archers, whether it be Doctor Who. I mean, the kids are being brainwashed by the kids that have come out of university and got themselves directors in television, producers in television. And is it any surprise we've got the society we have? No, I totally agree with you. It, it is a form of brainwashing, and it's it's interesting. I mean, the BBC are, are totally woke, without a shadow of a doubt, and you know, the way they report the news is just completely unacceptable from my perspective. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it's worldwide. I mean, the way Disney's operating is just completely terrible, frankly. I mean, just about every new Disney film now has to include transgender characters, and it's just... Like you say, it's, it is a form of brainwashing, but it's interesting the extent to which it's targeted at children. So they particularly focus on programmes that they think children will be watching. Um, but as, you know, they think they're winning that battle, so they then move on to, to, to older age groups. And they're trying to now make it almost as though it's unacceptable to talk about um, God created male and female and and um, God has created man and woman to come together to produce children. It's almost as though, oh, you don't say that. I mean, we, we've had the situation, as you know, where the president of the CPA just put in, in a leaflet that she put out in to be mayor of Lewisham. You know, I believe marriage between a man and a woman is a fundamental building block of society and the safest environment for raising children. And they sacked her from her work for saying that. And, you know, she had to go to a tribunal. And she, fortunately, she won a case at tribunal. But they're trying to say now it's unacceptable. It's totally unacceptable to be a Christian and to believe in basic Christian values. And, you know, if, if, you, if you talk about basic Christian values, you'll be dismissed from your work. You know, you've got to be scared to talk about it. That is what is evil. That is what is very, very evil. Well, you use the word evil, and um, I would agree with that. But the church is heading this up. The Church of England, the Roman Catholic Church out of Rome, are all going down the same flight yeah. path. Yeah, no, that's well, it's interesting enough as if you read my book, which is, you know, The Authority of the Nations, God and Politics, Chapter 3 is the Satanic Agenda. And point 10 of the Satanic Agenda is to get the church to make these changes. So what we're talking about is fundamental Marxist infiltration. I mean, people might think, oh, you know, you talk about Marxist infiltration. It's not, you know, I'm sorry, it's real. It's very, very real. And it's real in a large parts of our society. It's certainly real in the media, but it's also real in the church. And, you know, when I was at the National Prayer Breakfast and I heard the Bishop of London say, Jesus doesn't tell me what to believe, you know, you know full well that this is not a committed Christian seeking to put forward Christian values in the church. We're talking about a senior, very senior bishop in the Church of England who's actually now in charge of producing um, new prayers to bless same-sex couples. She's got no allegiance to, um, to Christianity. She's got no allegiance to the Bible. I mean, I'm sure if you actually said to her, are you born again? She'd say, what are you talking about? You know, so, you know, being born again has got nothing to do with me. You know, I mean, it's, but these people are in the church. So, unfortunately, there's no proper mechanism. Oh, by the way, you've also got a situation where the person in charge of appointing bishops is himself in a same-sex relationship. You know, it's like, what on earth is going on? So, it's not surprising that the bishops vote majority for blessing same-sex marriages because they've been appointed on that basis. And you know, I've seen it. I've seen it here. I was quite shocked, frankly, that um, I had my hustings in 2017 in Hitchin, and the chair of the hustings was uh, vicar of a local church. And um, when I started talking about marriage and abortion, she's like, "Oh, sorry, no, turn off the microphone. We don't want we don't want somebody in this hustings talking about marriage and and opposing abortion. You know, turn off the microphone." She, you know. 
And it's like oh, afterwards, people are saying, oh, it's disgusting the way she treated you. She's not now been made a bishop. <laughs> it's just like, oh, this is the sort of person from a, leading a tiny church, hard, very few people going to her church, but made a bishop. You know, it's just nonsense. It's utter nonsense. People are made bishops because of what they believe, not because they're successful vicars that, that run successful large churches, which how it should operate. I mean, in most of business, if you're if if you're successful in your you know in your business, I mean, you know, when I was involved in the Prudential, the people who were the most successful salesmen, you know, got promoted, and that's how it normally operates in business. If you're successful, you do a good job, you get promoted. In the church, it's, you don't get promoted for being successful; you get promoted if if you support same-sex marriage or support the woke ideas. I mean, it's just utter, utter nonsense. Well, going on from this, Sid, we often play a clip. I've got another clip for you. And it's about Disney, uh, where Disney are at the moment. And yes. it's a bit fascinating. Let's watch it. I'm Alan Bergman. I'm the co-chair of the entertainment division at Disney. And we have a special announcement to make today. As you know, Disney is a place of magic. It's where... Frogs turn into princes, where orphans like Cinderella can transform into a beautiful princess. And unlike us jaded adults, the children believe in magic. And we spent a hundred years cultivating a brand that has been trusted and loved by families for generations. And with that trust, we've covertly been inserting queerness into our films and television shows. First as LGBTQ background characters and later in leading roles and plot points. And few parents know that two years ago now for Pride Month on Disney Plus, our streaming service, we streamed the Disney Plus drag queen extravaganza to help introduce queer ideologies and sexualities to the children and encourage them to experiment on their own. And we're proud of our perfect DEI score, our diversity, equity, and inclusion score, but we always strive to go above and beyond what is expected. And so we're proud to announce that this summer we're gonna be opening Disney-themed pediatric transgender clinics for the children across the country. As you know, there's still a tremendous stigma against parents deciding to change the gender of their children, especially for those raising their children as gender non-binary and using they, them pronouns. And so we're confident that with our Disney brand puberty blockers and our character themed clinics that we can help reduce this stigma and we can normalize these ideas and we can make them mainstream. Other brands like Bud Light, Gillette and Pantene have helped pave this path and we're proud to take the lead and bring us into the new world order. We wanna thank Governor Gavin Newsom, President Joe Biden, Assistant Health Secretary, uh, Rachel Levine, an incredible woman. And notice I didn't say transgender woman. She's a real woman. And it's about time that we stop making these divisive distinctions when talking about her and others. So every patient will receive a free season pass to any Disney theme park. And just for coming in for a consultation, you'll get a free six-month subscription to our Disney Plus streaming service. So... Bring the kids on in. We look forward to, to taking care of them. We'll be seeing you soon. Well, uh, Disney uh, have covered themselves in glory, or have they? Um, this is on the internet site, I think, with Twitter and various other um, uh, entities. Um, and uh, Disney have been very unwise and allowed the BBC-type uh, disease to get into them. Uh, it's rebounded them on them as with Budweiser and Co. It's rebounded on them. So great. The American public seems to get it, uh, although the British public seem to be a bit far uh, behind. Uh, but um, can I say you've got to be so careful what's on the net, because that actually is a spoof. It's a comedian. Um, and um, he was just taking advantage of the situation and taking it to the OTT, which it really is. Disney haven't got that far uh, overboard uh, already, might come. Uh, but can we say at this stage between us, Sid, that um, as Christian people, 
you've got to be so careful not to be taken in by things like this. Get to the background, do your investigation without shedding this and misleading people. Well, that's right. I mean, they say many a true word is said in jest, and um, there's an awful lot of truth in that clip. Although, of course, there's, although there's some of the details are untrue, but all, all they're doing, frankly, is taking what's going on now and projecting it forward and saying, well, if we continue on the same tra tra trajectory as we are now, we'll get to a point where they're actually producing training and they're producing clinics you know in order to encourage young people and so on and so forth i mean that's that's just basically taking what's going on now to uh to a future conclusion if if there's no alteration but um we should be clear of course it's not currently happening so what they've actually said is not currently the what the situation is but what currently the situation is is that disney is promoting transgenderism in just about all their films. And frankly, it is completely and totally unacceptable. We've been talking about Christianity, religion. Um, let's talk about the religion that's on the biggest up in Great Britain, and that's the green religion. Mm. Uh, and so it has become. Uh, we've recently learned they've cut 16 million trees down in Scotland. Now, uh, a lot of the mountains and hills there can only grow trees. They grow very well, spruce-type trees. Um, so what on earth did you come down? More oxygen for the earth? Uh, it's a win-win. No, it's not. Uh, not against a windmill that produces electricity. So they're taking 16 million trees down. Um, and everybody's rejoicing. They're going to put windmills up in the place. Um, recent figures and stats on windmills. 14 years average life. Costly to maintain in the extreme, especially if you put them out to sea. Carbon footprint coming out of their ear holes. Because if you look at the manufacture of these things, it costs a lot of money. And the carbon footprint is very large. And of course, the biggest no-no is that when it's not windy, it's a waste of time. You've got to get your coal-fired furnaces going or some other thing to back you up. Um, but as long as it's green, it's all right. Now, the lie, and I am not exaggerating when I say lie about this movement, is how much carbon dioxide is bad for us as human beings, the nation, the world, and its longevity. Now, the facts are as follows. We have gone in the last 50 years up from 250 to 350-ish parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. Oh, well, we're all going to die. Greta, uh, 10 years and others. But, Sid, we're at the bottom end of the scale. If you look at the science behind this, you can get up to 1,200 per parts per million without batting an eyelid at any even higher than that. The higher the number up to, let's say, 1,200, the better it is for the world because photosynthesis does its bit. You grow more plants. Won't be long before the Sahara Desert is green again at that rate. If you get down to 150, which 250 that we've mentioned hitherto is not far off. You die, then you do die because photosynthesis doesn't work from 150 downwards. So we all run out of oxygen. Now, we're not being told the truth, Sid. Why? Well, obviously, there's a very clear agenda going on with the whole environment movement. And as, we, as we've said before, um, behind the envir environment movement is the desire to create a one world government because they're creating all this, you know, oh, with climate emergency, climate emergency, you know, and obviously it, it can only be solved by lots of countries working together. It can't be solved by one co country working on its own. So that's all part of the whole agenda. But if we talk about the reality for a minute, what you've actually said about windmills is extremely important because what they tend to do when they talk about the energy produced by windmills is they say, oh, it's incredibly cheap. 
because the um, the energy is only 9p or something a therm. Yeah, I mean, it's um, they're saying, oh, it's far cheaper than energy produced from gas-fired power stations, you know, which um, may be true at the, at, at the margin, but you've got to take the total situation into account, like you're saying. So you've got to take into account the cost of production plus the cost of decommissioning. And it's the same with nuclear, by the way. I mean, because nuclear, they're saying, oh, it's very clean. You know, there's no carbon from nuclear. But in order to assess the real cost of nuclear, you've got to take into account the cost of building the nuclear power station plus the cost of decommissioning, because that's all, all part of the cost. You can't just look at, the say, how much does it cost this year, you know, to, to produce nuclear power from a station that's already there. You know, you've got to look at the whole picture. And that's that's the reality of it. Now, as far as actual carbon itself is concerned, I mean, the, to me, the whole the idea that 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 the problem we've got in the world is all man made is certainly not proven. What people have to realise is that naturally uh, the earth gets warmer and it also gets colder in certain phases. I mean, in the past, we've had an ice age you know and people are saying oh well you know that time everything was really cold and then in in, in other times the earth naturally warms up you know it's but we do know that there was a problem with the ozone layer that was caused by chlorofluorocarbons we do know that so that problem had to be dealt with but we're not by no means clear that carbon is causing a massive problem or, or a massive man-made problem um so you know it's um <laughs> The, the jury's out and we've got to look at this science and we should be looking at the science and not just jumping to conclusions all the time. Uh, the other side of this, by the way, is, is the fact that I'm a firm believer that God created the world and that God is in charge of the world. I mean, when Jesus was on earth, one of the things they said to him was, look at the, who is this, that the wind and the waves obey him. You know, Jesus had power over nature and you know we're actually told that if you humble yourself and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways i will hear from heaven and forgive your sin and heal your land so if we want the land healed god tells us what we need to do and it's not all focusing on reducing carbon emissions the idea by the way that if we just focus on reducing carbon emissions that will solve the problems of the world is, as far as I'm concerned, a satanic lie. Interesting. Right, let's go for something else that's interesting. Um, remember the good old days when you got to your 20s and you decided to buy your first house? Well, that seems to have gone by the board because nearly half of the 20 to 29-year-olds have to go to the bank of mum and dad to get them on the first rung of the ladder. Um, that is terrible. Uh, so what's happened? Um, well, a number of things. Um, there are no less houses than there used to be. Uh, therefore, there must be more people. Well, yes, there are. Um, they are called legal immigrants. Let's put the illegal immigrants on one side. And um, although it's not fashionable to say so, Sid, if you've got net uh, forget zero as climatically called out, uh, net immigration um, for five years, it's been suggested you'll solve that problem and probably the NHS problem. Oh, no, we need these people coming from abroad to fund our NHS. Uh, really? Uh, we probably need more of our people that have been going to universities rather than inviting Four people, three of them not working from abroad to get one nurse or carer. The whole thing's madness. Um, families are giving, on average, mum and dad bank, £25,000. That's a lot of money. But why? Let's have another stat. Um, average mortgage now turns out to be nearly 200000 My goodness me, you just suggested that 20 years ago, did I thought. You're mad, but it is. So in other words, payments have gone up because of the increased interest rate from 890 a month to 1290 a month, nearly 1300 pounds. 
that is a lot and that's the last two years so fundamentally we need to do something and you can't do it fast because you've got to build houses it takes time you've got planning permission you've got various hoops to jump through it take 10 years they won't net immigration do it straight away all at once over to you sid well, I'm a big believer in helping people where they are. And I think people should be strongly discouraged from leaving their home and um, coming over to the West, because it's not just the UK, it's also lots of other countries in the West. What a lot of people don't realise is that the last year for which figures are available, net migration to Germany was actually 1.45 million people whereas net migration to the UK was 750,000. And people think 750,000 is an incredibly high figure, which it is. But it's actually um, something like half the net migration to Germany. So it's not just a British problem. But what we should be doing is discouraging people from um, leaving their home, wherever it is, whether it's Nigeria or where it's elsewhere in Africa or, 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 or whether it's from some um, Middle East country. We should be discouraging them from that and we should be trying to help them uh, these in their own country to live and to make progress. But interestingly enough, what we are doing, unfortunately, is actually trying to impose on these countries uh, what are woke values in the UK. So we're actually saying that uh, if you don't uh, support same-sex marriage and if you don't have free abortion, then we're not giving you any aid or any support. And that's all in the latest government white paper, which I've been reading. And that, to me, is something which is completely unacceptable and, in a sense, is encouraging immigration because rather than actually helping these countries with their own values, which in many cases are Christian values, there's more than 30 African countries that are actually uh, opposed to homosexuality, that criminalise homosexuality, and that is their choice. I'm not saying that's something that they should do or something that we should do in this country, but I am saying that they've got a right to make that decision and to make those laws in their country. And to have this idea that, oh, we're not giving you any aid or support if you criminalise homosexuality is wrong. It's totally wrong. And it's some of that that's causing the problems, I'm afraid, in the world. Right, we are coming to the end of the programme. Time is flying, uh, but there's two items we've got to cover. We've got to get back to football and Joey Barton. Uh, Joey Barton's had a bit of a mixed um, uh, existence uh, from a player at Manchester City, uh, always a bit bolshy, to a bolshy manager. And he's got bolshy about uh, women's football. But has he got it right? Now, there's a big uh, debate at the moment uh, about um, uh, ladies being uh, infused into Sky Sports, BBC, etc. as commentators. My goodness me, what are they saying? Well, a lot of people are saying, and Joey especially, is saying, and I quote, um, it's like uh, asking me to talk about knitting patterns. Now, um, yes, I know what he means, but and I've seen it myself on watching football matches. There are now, more often than not, two ladies and two men as commentators introduce us to a football match. And it's a quota system. And I see the professional men who've played the game at the highest level being embarrassed. And even Paul Scholes had had enough the other day. And blatantly said, what do you mean? When she was clearly talking rubbish. Uh, she did not know the men's day game. She never experienced it. She might have been playing at a, a women's level, which frankly, on average, is way down below Vauxhall League level, as was. Um, you cannot commentate on something you don't know about. But in inclusivity terms, of course you can. You've got to have a quota. Sid, um, he put his head above the parapet, Joey Barton, a brave man. There's very few like him. Well, I think he's probably gone over the top. But um, what I would say is that my very good friend, Dan Walker, is an absolute brilliant an, an analyst 
when it comes to football, as well as a brilliant presenter of football. And he was, of course, presenting for the BBC, but he's now gone to Channel 5. But um, that's the sort of person we want. And he's also, by the way, a devout Christian. And it seems as though the impression we get is that if you're a devout Christian, we don't want you. But if you're woke and you're and you're this way of thinking, then we do want you. And it's just like their ability is just goes by the board. And it's what I was saying earlier about the church. I mean, we should have a proper meritocracy where the best people are put in place. And instead of that, we have oh, people put in place because of their ideas and because of their beliefs. And that's why you end up with people that are second rate. Yes, indeed. Um, lastly, we cover a topic called Royal Mail v Amazon. Um, Royal Mail have been trying to in, uh, reinvent themselves for a long time. It's not working. It's not surprising. Uh, the email has de decimated them. Uh, the price of letters compared with an email and the immediacy, immediacy of an email. Um, and uh, they thought, oh, we'll go into parcels. Uh, but they didn't think that one through because they've got to compete against DPD, uh, who are pretty slick, and Amazon itself. Now, Amazon making vast profits. The Royal Mail lost about half a billion pounds, I think, last year, or pretty close on. But they've got a very strong union, one of the strongest, Sid, that are not willing to reintroduce modern practices to get over this because... A lot of it can be done, but like the train drivers, they insist on having a guard when the guard is not needed. They insist that they've got to work set hours, uh, forget delivery at, at any other day of the week. Saturdays is becoming a no-no for deliveries. Um, they'll destroy themselves, just like the mine workers said. Well, yeah, as I said before, when it comes to industrial disputes, and what you should do is um, negotiate, debate, and if you're into a situation where the management are being completely unreasonable and you have to take industrial action, you start it and you finish it as quickly as you possibly can. You do not allow an industrial dispute to go on and on and on because, quite frankly, you're only harming your industry and you're harming your workers. And uh, I'm afraid there's too many disputes that are fundamentally political and are not actually helping the industry at all. See, the thing is, if you're doing things that are effectively destroying your industry, you know, then you're not representing your members properly at all. You cannot say you're effectively representing your members and taking action that's destroying your industry. Sorry, no. Well, um, the last strap line on this one a lot of people don't realise how Amazon work. They see their vans flying around. Um, but it's a deal which is being questioned as we speak, whether you're employed or self-employed. Now, the fundamentals of all this, of course, is there's an out like uh, a hungry self-employed person compared with an employed person. They're going to get off their butt early in the morning and work till every delivery is made. And the Amazon drivers in a lot of countries are self-employed. Mr. Amazon comes along and says, have you got £10,000? Would you like to be an Amazon driver? And they form a, a sort of partnership whereby they get the van, the training, and uh, Amazon gives them the leads of the deliveries. Now, if you get yourself about 15 vans, and a lot of people do, and even more, as a self-employed person, then you will earn the minimum of £150,000 a year by sub-franchising, I suppose, employing other people. But um, that's interesting, Sid. I repeat, nobody works like you when you've got something to aim for. Uh, they're delivering it at half the price of um, the post office, uh, the Royal Mail, um, and it seems to work. Should more people be therefore working for themselves? Should we follow Amazon's precepts? Well, what what you're saying is undoubtedly true because we, we it was seen actually in the whole haulage industry in the UK because the haulage industry used to be um, state owned, and when it was state owned 
I mean, frankly, it worked appallingly badly, and uh, everybody that was in the haulage industry just did the minimum that they had to do in order to complete their wages. And if their truck broke down, they just sat at home and did nothing and said, I can't do anything today because my truck's broken down. But when they privatised the whole thing and suddenly people were, were running their own trucks, um, they worked much, much harder. In fact, the government had to introduce laws to say you can't drive more than eight hours a day because a lot of people were ha happy to drive all day and all night in order to, uh, to to get the work done, which then became dangerous. But, you know, the whole industry was completely transformed and it now works incredibly efficiently with people working by and large for themselves or they're working for their for, for their business and yeah absolutely people will work much harder if they've got a got a say in what's going on but you see it doesn't have to necessarily be self-employed but what you want is to have a stake in your business so for instance if you have a profit sharing agreement or you have a share ownership which is can be introduced in a large company you know, and so people feel as though it's my company, it's my business, it's I'm working to 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 seek to to be a part of a successful business. It can be it can be very big, but that's what that's what's needed. There we go. We covered some topics there. My goodness me, we have. Um, Christmas is approaching. Whether that's good or bad for the Conservative Party, even the Labour Party. Uh, time will tell they're going to have some time off unless they suddenly decide to sit over Christmas to solve our problems. Can't see that for one minute, Sid. Yes. Well, I'm hoping that um, the true meaning of Christmas will come, come through. I mean, the true meaning of Christmas is wonderful. You know, it's it's the son of God leaving heaven and coming to earth um, because of his love for humanity and willing to actually give himself and surrender himself and to being to be limited by human conditions you know and subjecting himself to death death on a cross for us i mean it's a wonderful thing it's a wonderful event to celebrate the son of god coming to earth and those of us who are christians will celebrate with joy Unfortunately, the whole thing has been incredibly commercialised, but hopefully the commercial side of Christmas will not destroy the Christmas message because that's what it's all about. Yes, commerciality satisfies for five minutes when you receive the Christmas present, uh, but it don't last very long. Sid, yeah. thank you so much. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Cheers.